Hey everyone, welcome to another video review. So um, this is a more recent piece, the most recent I've got. Uh, I wanted to start by kind of showing the source material. So this is from J. Scott Campbell's Fairy Tale Fantasies calendar. This is December, um, and this shows Tinkerbell. I'm gonna lift it up so we have a little bit less glare. But it shows Tinkerbell, um, just so that we know. Looking demure and pretty. She's sort of scrunched up, sitting on spools of thread. There's a key, measuring tape, thimble, some pins in the background, a comb, a scissor. Just want to kind of pay attention or draw attention. This is actually a key. The scissor is way up here. So I just want to kind of pay uh, attention to all of the elements of this uh, picture by J. Scott Campbell, which he, of course, did brilliantly. The gossamer wings right here, and then the sun coming from above. You have the scissor here, the two long knitting needles, the different color spools of thread, balls of yarn. And so it kind of really um, sort of accentuates Tinkerbell's small size by showing her against the backdrop of all of these um, common, you know, knitting and sewing tools. So, and you have a little bit of pixie dust um, uh, scattered throughout. So this is definitely one of my, you know, favorite uh, depictions of Tinkerbell from the calendar. And the reason I'm showing you all of this is because this is the source material for an amazing uh, sculpt by Wilbert Hovon Beer. Here it is right here. So this is the uh, 3D representation of that source art. And I think you'll agree when you look at what Roberto has done here and then you compare to the source material here that it's pretty remarkable. He looked at this, he turned that into this. Um, this is a really, really difficult thing to create, um, to take a two-dimensional representation of a character and a scene and then translate it appropriately into 3D. You know, you have to do a lot of thinking and a lot of things around the corners to see what it's like from the sides, the back. Uh, and again, he did an amazing job putting this together. Uh, this is one of those situations where um, the the base, so-called, is as important as the actual uh, statue itself. And in fact, when you look at this, um, Tink herself is, you know, arguably one of the smaller uh, pieces on this thing. She is central to it, but what makes this uh, uh, kind of this amazing work of art is everything around it. And again, it really um, serves to accentuate, just like the source material does, how tiny and small she is when you put her um, in the context of all of these spools of thread. So there's so much to look at here. Um, I guess we'll just start with the base. Uh, this was painted, by the way, by John Allred, uh, who did a spectacular job. Uh, this is a kit that's uh, produced by Pathos Creations. Um, if you want to do the legwork, you can find him and contact him and try to uh, get uh, a version of this kit. It is uh, pretty rare, and I think it's still in production because people obviously are still interested, but um, be warned that the uh, wait list for this is pretty long um, because there's just so much interest. And finally, understand that when you're getting it, it's gonna be unpainted, uh, and it really requires um, her to be in the hands of a master who can then appropriately customize it and do the work you need to do to bring it to life. Um, so this is not what this is gonna look like out of the box and you know, obviously the, the expense of uh, creating something like this is uh, going to be not insignificant, okay? So let's start with the base. A very, very kind of classy wood base right here. We have the brass key that we see from the source material. We have the tape measure. This is actually resin, but John actually put a little bit of paper measuring tape over it to give it that extra spark of reality. Um, here are some beads on the side, maybe like part of a necklace. Um, take a look here. Again, little tiny beads and bells. 
kind of just you know, haphazardly thrown here. There's the thimble right over there, and then you have the various spools of thread uh, kind of put together here, and then she's on the biggest spool. You have the balls of uh, um, wool or yarn. This is a real scissor that he actually adapted. Uh, he felt like it was a, a, this is a real scissor with a, it's a working scissor with a point and an edge. Um, he got from an antique store. It looks like it fits perfectly. So he replaced the original scissor with this one. Um, the kit did not come with a uh, comb in the background. So every um, paint master who uh, builds this kit will have their own um, individual comb that they're gonna find. Here's where all the little bobby pins are stuck into this. Also very nice. Here's the purple yarn. Here's the comb resting on it and here's the two bobby pins sticking out. So as you can see, it looks fantastic. Here are the translucent wings on the back. And a Tinkerbell, of course, sitting or perched um, on the spool. Let's get a little bit closer look on her. You can see the detail of the costume. He even went so far at my request to put in some of the freckles, which is again, very true to the source art. He added in a little bit of green in her hair, again, accurate to the source material. Here's the freckles here. You can see the freckles on her face, the blue eyes. Beautiful pose, very naturalistic pose. And of course, a very nice detailed paint job by John, bringing her to life. The back out. Let's go a little bit closer. Some of the work he did with the spools, the sculpt on the thread is amazing. I mean, if you didn't touch it, you would feel like it was real thread, real uh, spool, real wool, real yarn. Okay, I'm gonna start the machine rolling. Get this turntable going. This is a real comb right there that John sourced. Just kind of showing off the base. Okay, second turn around. Let's go a little bit deeper now. Take a look at Tink. The flash does wash some of the color away, but I think it's really important here just to show the detail that John went to to bring everything to life. I'll do another quick turnaround with the flash off so you have a better idea of sort of the natural shading, and shadow, and coloration, and all of that. And then we're gonna back off a little bit so you can see the whole piece as she turns. You can kind of appreciate how the entire thing comes together. You know, sometimes um, you gotta be careful when the base is so busy or so big or so over the top that it kind of detracts from the actual statue or um, you know, the central piece itself. Um, or you have a situation where the base is just completely boring, black, uh, does, really does nothing for the entire um, you know, statue. And in today's day and age, you do want to have a little something at least to distinguish that than just a simple black base. 
Um, so I think this one is very interesting in the sense that it's just the perfect complement. You have a very, very busy base. It's overflowing with the detail, with things, brass keys, thimbles, spools, scissors, combs, but um, it fits together beautifully because it kind of gives you this um, just wonderful impression of a very jumbled mess of tools that a seamstress would use, uh, someone who's like you know busy, um, you know, darning things or you know sewing things together, and then in the midst of this sort of very um, busy but convincing uh, display of elements, you then have Tinkerbell herself, which is this fantastical uh, creature sitting in the middle of all of that. And she's very ethereal, she's very beautiful, um, and she sits in these common mundane things, and somehow the two elements kind of combine to create this work of art, and it's just like amazing. And um, everyone involved uh, with the project um, deserves a lot of credit, of course, starting with J. Scott Campbell, who created this in the first place, who conceived it in the first place, and um, whose art I showed to sort of kind of set the, the foundation, set the groundwork for this, and then Roberto for actually managing to pull it off to actually translate that two-dimensional picture into a 3D sculpture and doing it so amazingly well. And then, of course, John Allred for uh, finally actually bringing it to life and then customizing it, replacing certain parts with his own, uh, you know, what he considers better parts, uh, just sort of what we call plussing the piece and making it truly uh, his own. And then, of course, um, truly a unique piece for me to own and to showcase. And you know, this has been painted by quite a few people. Um, you know, I think Jim Capone did the official um, you know, prototype version for Pathos Creations, and he did, uh, as he always does, a phenomenal job. And obviously, John Allred just did this one for me, and I think there was a, at least one or two others um, after that. It's been entered in Wonderfest competitions. Uh, I believe it has won, because this is just such a unique uh, kit, a unique statue with so many things going on, it's really uh, kind of meant um, to, uh, you know, be built and to be entered into competitions. Um, it really, you know, kind of unlocks all the potential that uh, these amazing paint masters have of um, creating, you know, these works of art and adding their own voice to it. So I'm really uh, pleased and uh, proud to own this. And um, I hope that you kind of enjoyed it. This is something definitely that you're not gonna see a lot of uh, video review of on YouTube, for instance. Uh, so few of these are out there. Uh, so I'm just kind of happy to be able to uh, bring it to you. Uh, in the second phase, uh, in the second little clip, I'll just um, do a little bit more turnaround uh, with her without the flash. So again, you can sort of see what she looks like in more natural uh, lighting. So here we go. Welcome back. So this is her still going through her um, automated turn, but now without flash. So let's get a little bit closer. You can kind of see how the colors look without being washed out. You can kind of get a feel for the shadows, how things look, the depth of the color and the detail. There's the scissor, the body pins. Just remarkable. There's tank again, this tiny shadow. There's some of the freckle work. On the shoulders, the back, those are wings, see through. I can't get too close on this side, I'll run into those bobby pins. So I'll wait for her to spin around a little more. And then we'll go through this way. back out again so you can have the whole picture she's one sixth scale which is just right for this type of composition 
any larger and obviously the comb and the scissor elements just wouldn't work. And the comb and the scissors and the bar uh, and the balls of uh, yarn, the bobby pins, the spools, those are all meant to be, you know, a little bit, I think, you know, bigger than one to one scale or just one to one scale, actually. I think it is an appropriate one to one scale. And so this kind of gives you an idea of Tink herself. So actually, I stand corrected. I mean, I guess technically she's life size. This is how, how big she is, right? She's one to one scale fairy. All of the other fairy tale fantasy scopes are one uh, one six scale, but in this case, we have a one one scale Tinkerbell because she is small. Just let her turn one more time. A little bit of detail of her back. Very nice. We'll stop it here. So again, just sort of one last pass from the amazing base all the way up to Tinkerbell herself and back out again. Tinkerbell Fairy Tale Fantasies, sculpted by Roberto Von Beer, painted by John Allred. Hope you enjoyed that. Until next time, take care.